All right. Uh, welcome back to Never Did It, a uh, podcast where two guys talk about movies that they've never seen before. And this week, as we cover a couple of films from 1979, we're joined by Mike Noyes and Charles Peterson of the Random Acts of Cinema podcast, which is much more organized. These fellas each week pick a Criterion movie by random number generator or by random number generator of a human's brain. Uh, who suggests them one and uh, talk about that uh, Criterion release, which I just think is the coolest conceit for a podcast. Th- there are so many Criterion movies that I for sure would never, ever watch. And it's great to have a reason to get into them. Uh, so I'm Brad Garoon. I'm, I'm joined by Jake Ziegler as well. Let's jump into a movie that I'm afraid I'm going to have to defend with my life. <laughs> uh, it's Albert Brooks's de- directorial debut, Real Life. Jake, I picked this for you because I love it. And I love all things Albert Brooks, uh, except for looking for comedy in the Muslim world. And I especially love this movie. Before the episode started, Jake told me he hated it. Uh, (laughs) So that's what I'm dealing with. Charlie, you mentioned before we went on that you also don't love Albert Brooks. What's the Uh, At least a lot of his films. Yeah. I know that Lost in America and Defending Your Life are both Criterion releases. Have you covered either of those yet? Not yet. Not yet. Well, (laughs) I guess I don't look forward to that for you <laughs> so yeah, I mean, we have to, um, to sometime in the next 900 episodes we'll cover it yeah defending your life i love uh charlie and i in high school rented lost in america together and we hated that but yeah. I, and I we, we were it told it was the greatest american comedy ever made and we were pretty excited because lost in america is my least favorite albert brooks well i again i don't count looking for comedy mm. but um lost in america just didn't click it's like barely a movie i think um, it's generational i don't know <laughs> Yeah, maybe. Uh, Yeah, maybe it's a bit of a uh, easy rider situation. Yeah. Well, let's just start in the way we always do. Jake, why did you hate real life? Um, I just I I didn't think it was funny. And I like you, I love Albert Brooks. You know, I I, I like all his guest spots on The Simpsons. Um, I love defending your life. I love broadcast news. I love the character he plays in broadcast news. Uh, That's one of my favorite movies. So I was really excited about, uh, you know, about watching this movie. Um. And knowing that you like it and knowing that more often than not, our taste, you know, is, is more or less uh, similar. I was excited for this and and I was just really bored with it. And I didn't think like any of the gags went anywhere. You know, the, the when, like when he goes into the gynecologist's office for the scene, I didn't like that. There weren't like, I didn't feel like there was that many jokes there. It just, it didn't, not much of it made me laugh or like the horse surgery. Like, it sounds like that's going to be funny. Like describing it out <laughs> loud sounds like it's going to be funny. But then watching it was not like, it just didn't make me laugh. Charles Grodin, who is so funny and other things just a total blank slate here i just didn't i didn't get anything from the movie i was i was really i mean it, it upset me i i want you to know that that it, that that i take no joy in in disliking this movie and and i was deeply hurt by by not liking this movie and and, and it upset me to tell you i ate that uh uh charlie what do you think about real life uh well quickly um i would say i don't like the films of albert brooks very much i like albert brooks find his style of humor fine. Uh, I just think when he's sort of writing um, long form material, it tends to rely on, like this movie, kind of um, boomer crutches of like, can you believe this white suburban crazy post hippie world we're all in? Oh, we're such hypocrites, right? Um, That just, I I don't know, it just doesn't resonate with me that strongly. That being said, this movie's pretty good. All right. Wow. It's pretty good. I mean, like, I I don't love it because it's still all of the things that I just criticized. (laughs) <laughs> um, but I would argue that like it's it has jokes. I would say the jokes aren't huge. What it has is that kind of like, you know, kind of like awkwardness that is being generated that, you know, you, you find funny or you don't. Right. And some people absolutely uh, adore. Um, I think what really makes this movie striking and I don't know how much credit to give Albert Brooks for this or not, or I guess I guess all of it is how like crushingly prescient it is. You know, I, I don't think when he made real life in 1979, he was thinking like of the omnipresent deluge of like reality TV and social media and how that would like, you know, absolutely overlay itself on like human society. I think he's making fun of like how people on the news never act real because there's a camera on them. Right. right. Well, it's also a direct spoof of a documentary television show that was on a few years earlier that was a, such a sensation because it made people feel well, for that same reason, like. Because you can be a fly in the wall in someone's house as their life is falling apart because they're on television. Exactly. So yeah, and, he's and I mean, I, I think he hits on something, right? Like how 
um, out Groden, right? But the children, like all of them become, you know, kind of like addicted to the screen, right? And, and the possibilities of what that offers and how it just absolutely just rinse asunder modern life you know a lot of his stuff about oh i'm a director and i'm so single-minded i'm an auteur blah 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 like honestly that's that's the stuff i can kind of do without but it's when the when the world falls apart just because they're just trying to make something interesting and good that's shocking and, and how it fragments the human soul right all those bits about the psychologist coming in right it seems kind of like a tired kind of overdone thing but you're kind of like yeah that's these are issues that we still talk about today like on a profound level, like how is social media, how is reality TV, you know, destroying our lives? What does it mean to have a child say, I want to grow up and be an uh, influencer, or I want to grow up and do reality TV stars? Like, what does that even mean? You know, it's such a such a crazy space to kind of put your mind into. And and I think he he taps into that kind of paranoia. Yeah, well, I have an 11 year old who has said she wants to be a YouTube. So she doesn't say it as much anymore. I mean, now that she's a little bit older, but I mean, it, it has been said in my house in the past. So yeah, of course, yeah. definitely a thing. Yeah. Yeah. It'll come back. My, my half brother just turned 18 and throughout many different points in his life, he's gone between wanting to be a boxer, a doctor and a YouTube star with mm -hmm. no boxer? content. To, yes. A boxer. <laughs> um, <What? laughs> I'm sure he saw it on YouTube. Um, <laughs> thankfully he's not on TikTok. Uh, Mike, what'd you think of the movie? As a concept, I think it's very interesting, especially when the movie came out. Like, like I think like, like what Charlie said, it's, it predicts so many things for a movie that came out in 1979, how much of it kind of resonated with today was rather shocking. Like, I mean, you've got the, the goofiness of like the, the cameras that go over the head. You know, which is very silly, but like, you know, it's also seems like not that out of the ordinary. Like if someone I mean, could come up with that. Just iPhones. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's predicting like cell phones for sure. That said, aside outside the premise, I didn't enjoy the movie that much. I was kind of I was kind of hope I was hoping I would a, you know, so I could come on the podcast and be like, yeah, great, fine. But, you know, as much as I love defending your life and as much as I hate uh, the muse and lost in America. You know, it's like these two polar ends of of comedy for me. And I was really curious where his, this, his first film, would fall on that. And I was hoping it would fall more towards Defending Your Life. But he's just, yeah, he's very annoying in it. And Charles <laughs> Broden, who I've had a tumultuous relationship with over the years, like some stuff I like him and some stuff I hate him in. This, he was very milk toast for me. Mm -hmm. There was a, a couple moments that kind of landed and... Honestly, at this point, I'm even trouble having trouble remembering which moments those were. So. Horse, horse, scene, horse scene was pretty good. Yeah, I love that horse scene. <laughs> I, I, I gotta say, the joke of him killing the horse, um, I'm kind of lost at that point. But like the whole thing of him like endlessly checking everything because he doesn't know what to do next because he's clearly in his head because the camera's right. on him. Mm -hmm. Just that build up of him like you know asking the same question over and over and like asking details about the horse that don't matter, right? <laughs> Like that, that's, and he's so flat. Right. Like, I, I, I get it, right? But it, that was pretty funny. Like, I kind of loved and hated the end. When he just snaps and burns their house down. Like, I thought might have been the funniest part to me. Because it was just <laughs> so absurd. And it was just like, it was bleak. This, yeah, this dude has lost his mind. And like, his, his project has fallen apart so, like, drastically that he's just, like, snapped and trying to come up with any kind of drama. And him going through the process of like, well, this movie ended that way, and this movie ended that way. Like, like my movie needs to end with an explosion. You know, like how he gets there. And you're like, you're like, I was like, oh, okay, yeah, but yeah, Albert Brooks is just something about the characters that he plays in his own movies can, is often very grating to me. <laughs> Have any of you seen any of his? So he is the innovator of SNL digital shorts. They weren't digital. Yeah, yeah. Have you guys seen his his SNL shorts? Funny. Yeah, yeah. Right. So I, defending your, not defending your life, real life especially, reminds me quite a bit of those shorts in that he's playing basically the same character as he does in a lot of those. And much like an SNL sketch, it seems like he doesn't really know how to end the movie. And so the movie <laughs> ends with a big fireball blowing it uh, Right. But, but another thing I want, I'm curious about, have any of you seen the show Review, uh, the Andy oh, Daly yeah. show Review? Mm -hmm. So I saw that before. That came out from 2014 uh, for a few years, I think a couple of seasons. I, I won't see it for another couple of years then. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, that, that's a, that's your pace. Yeah, it's yeah, so it's, good, but it's very dark. It's about a guy who's reviewing real life things, and then much. It's clearly very influenced by this movie uh, because his life starts falling apart around him as he's doing it, 
And spoiler alert for the show, sorry, Jake, I know you'll eventually watch it. He does murder accidentally his father-in-law uh, by <laughs> taking him on his lifelong dream of going in a shuttle, but forgetting to tell his father-in-law to buckle his seatbelt. Fred Willard, uh, in an amazing guest spot, is murdered by a, sh a space shuttle. And it reminded me a lot of this, where... Uh, especially the horse scene. And then Andy Daly in the show is pretty oblivious to what's going on around him. It, he needs to be in order to make this show happen. And Brooks is very persuasive, isn't the word. He's manipulative to everyone yeah. around him to try to get them to do what uh, he wants them to do for the show, which culminates in my favorite moment in the whole movie where he gets permission to go to the gynecologist um, <laughs> with the wife and the look on his face. He's so excited. He looks towards the camera and I need a freeze frame of it. He's so happy. <laughs> and then because of his reciprocation of her kindness, she starts getting a crush on him, which he doesn't want because he doesn't want to mm -hmm. be part of the family. So when she gives him a hug, he air pats her on the back. <laughs> that and these part are the got two. a genuine laugh for me. The air it was so funny. I just don't see how you can watch it and think these moments aren't hilarious. One thing, though, that I think you mentioned boomer humor. I think another problem might be like what I call the Shrek problem, where everything is a reference to real life or something happening in current events. Mm -hmm. And a lot of these seem to be that. So there's the whole conceit of the movie. But then there's also when they go to the gynecologist, he doesn't want to be filmed because of all the, you know, 20, 20, 60 yeah. minutes. Nightline, I think, right? Or something yeah. like that. 60 yeah. minutes. It was 60 minutes. Right. Yeah. And if you don't know that, th that that was a thing, or even that like a little bit more recently, like To Catch a Predator was a thing or, or anything mm. like that, like a Gen Z kid watching this, I was probably not going to understand any of the references. I'm sure I didn't understand most of them. I still think he is just unbeatably funny. So yeah, we mentioned that he has two Criterion releases. What's the story? How are these things aside? We're going to talk about this a bit. I have questions about this when it comes to the Bond movies, too, because I know there are none. Are That's none? not true. Well, are we talking Laserdisc or non-Laserdisc? Yeah, disc? we're is talking Laserdisc. Laser <laughs> you got it. Right, we're getting but, real nerdy this week. I love it. <laughs> well, this is my question. You've got Brooks, and I would say like the important movies for him are Defend Your Life and Real Life. Yeah. So how does Lost in America end up a Criterion release and not Real Life? Honestly, probably who owns the distribution rights. Hmm. They set up a deal with Criterion. I mean, Criterion, they do they do seek out films and try to acquire the rights for a release. And and sometimes they do, like, hey, we want to release your movie, a Criterion Edition, and they set up the deal and it happens. Right. But sometimes it's also they get a deal with like, you know, Warner Brothers or whoever, right? And they're mm -hmm. like, We would like to make a work with you to make a Criterion collection thing. And there I, I imagine there's a negotiation back and forth, but sometimes they bring things that are maybe a bit of a more of an argument to bring in th than others. Because if Criterion is truly a measure of the best films ever made, um, it's horrendously full of holes. Yeah, right. 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 Because what it is is a nowadays a DVD and streaming distribution company. Totally. That yeah. puts together a nice little package. Well, in some cases it puts together, but I just got the last picture show Texas Phil Criterion, gave it to myself as a birthday gift. And I've never wanted to watch Texas Phil until it came out <laughs> as a director's cut in black and white on this thing. Like, well, Now I'm curious. It probably still mm -hmm. sucks. Jake, I know that this movie has no Oscar love, but I also know that Ebert hated it. What can you tell me about that? Yeah, Ebert, uh, I read his review after I watched it too, because I, as I as I tend to do you know, with those movies that came out, and and yeah, he was very hard on the movie, uh, but he he liked the uh, the conceit of the movie, like the, the opening scene. He felt like the best bits of the movie were all wasted in the first 10 minutes. Like he loved the setup to it and then just thought like the rest of the movie was just a, a slog to get through with really without any good payoffs and without, you know, with nothing nothing good happening. Uh, for and It was uncomfortable in a bad way where it was just like, I just, you know, I, I, I don't want to see this guy breaking down the you know that scene like like we talked about at the end but you know right before he uh before he lights their house on fire he he was uncomfortable in a in a bad way a uh, movie it reminded me of and it took me a minute to think of this one i don't know if any of you guys ever saw this it's a pat oswalt movie came out 12 or 13 years ago now is this movie called big fan heard of it you remember that? yeah it was uh he was like a he's like a giants fan like a super super giants fan and they they build a i mean i don't know if i'm well, if i can spoil this movie i mean it's been out for spoil a big fan it's so, okay I, I think we can spoil it yeah nobody saw it <laughs> he's this giants fan and he you know he, he they're kind of building up this whole movie for, for him for like there's gonna be something like serious that happens and he's gonna you know he's gonna snap and he's gonna explode and it's gonna be like dramatic and he like 
I think it's like a sports right like a column or like a radio host or something and he like he's targeting this guy and he like ends up shooting paintball uh, shooting him with a paintball gun of red and blue color you know like like the Giants colors because this guy was like an Eagles fan or something and then that, that, <laughs> that and it kind of reminded me you know when uh, when I saw uh, Albert Brooks like lighting the house on fire I'm like oh yeah this is just a complete like ridiculous reaction to you know to what's going on to that and I thought mm-hmm. like maybe you know I could see Patton Oswalt have been influenced by an Albert Brooks film for sure mm-hmm. sure without a doubt Jake I have a question for you about how yeah. you rate movies because I'm a little confused okay um so I saw you gave this one and a half stars uh-huh. okay I just took a plane home from vacation last night and I watched on the plane Ruby Gilman teenage crack mm-hmm. okay this is a bad movie <laughs> and you gave it three and a half stars <laughs> Sure. I need to know <laughs> how, even though you le- hated or really, really, I mean, one and a half stars, you hated real life. Mm-hmm. I need to know how Ruby Gilman, Teenage Kraken, is a better movie than real life. <laughs> uh, well, number one, expectations. Uh, very, you know, for what I'm hoping to get out of Ruby Gilman, Teenage Kraken, is is very, very very small i'm hoping to have an enjoyable evening with my 11 year old daughter uh and, and if i have that and if i don't like hate the movie if it's not like completely insulting sure three three and a half stars whatever i don't think about it too much but like real life was such a like it was really disappointing like i said i was like super pumped for this i don't know if i if i made that clear uh you know before i watched everybody i was like really excited because i love defending your life i hadn't seen it until you were you know you had told me about it and i said i really do like albert brooks i mean like i said hank scorpio is like my favorite cartoon uh or you know tv character of all time like i could i've seen that episode a million times and i, and I laugh just as hard every time i watch it so i think it's it's part of the you know like the the pedigree of the movie uh you know my expectations for the movie you know kind of what i'm hoping to get out of it and what it you know actually gives to me and also too i i try not to think about it too hard because again it's just rating movies on letterbox you know like it's just kind of a gut you know sort of gut reaction and and that's really all there is to it you know i try not to put too much science too much science into it oh you drove me a little crazy with that one i know <laughs> all right mike and charlie i know you guys do your ratings uh but you do them out of 10 um, yeah. right yeah so what what's your we'll let you you know we'll be good hosts what's your rating out of 10 yeah i mean you, you know you you know, right, having a hypocrisy about movies, you really get in your head about ratings and kind of what they mean. And and to us, or at least to me, like some of these numbers mean more than just their numerical value at this point. Uh, so I'll give it I'll give it an eight, which is generally positive experience. It's really hard to get a nine. Pretty easy to get a 10. This is just like, it's a great movie. What, what do you want? Yeah. Nine <laughs> is like, it surprised you. Like it truly delighted you. It feels like a discovery, right? But an eight is like, yeah, pretty good. Um, Seven could take it down a little bit, but uh, I don't know. I, I kind of enjoyed this movie. Um, you know, I, I dislike <laughs> Albert Brooks when he's really trying to kind of do the conceptual Woody Allen thing. But when he's just being funny, he's funny. Um, and, uh, and like Hank Scorpio, I love Albert Brooks's voice. It's so like soothing and grating at the same time. It's just a, just a magical voice. voice. Yeah, but truly, uh, if we were doing this on our podcast, I would have said like seven and a half, eight. I'm going to say eight. I'm, I'm feeling up filling up on right. Bruce today. I love it. What about you, Mike? I would I would probably give it a five and a half because like five is like right down the middle, like not terrible, not good. Like it exists, but it didn't offend me. And like I said, I think I laughed enough to like bump it up to five and a half. Not enough to give it like the six. Like on, <laughs> on, on Flutterbox, they gave it a two and a half stars. So like that's, you know, on a ratio translation, that is like a five. But I think I think I liked it more than a five. So I give it a five and a half. Well, it's a nine for me, no doubt. For I wouldn't say it surprised me. I was expecting to love it. There's just some things like, as much as uh, any of y'all might have enjoyed the the fiery house ending, I was just like, yeah, this is this is a movie where he didn't know what to do with it. So, yeah. But it's you know, it's how you end the thing you don't know how to end, and that's right. kind of the point. He calls himself out right. on it, you know. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if that's um, lazy writing or clever writing. Have you guys seen before we move on to Moonraker? Have y'all seen Defending My Life, the the Albert Brooks documentary? No, no. Okay, it sounds like an it. Albert Brooks. Yeah, it's uh well for okay, uh, Charlie. Maybe you don't you don't watch it because of your feelings on Albert Brooks. But <laughs> Mike, recommend you do Jake. I don't know. Have you seen it yet? Not yet. No, but I, I do plan on it. I don't know what you're waiting for. Um, yeah. I think it's awesome. Let's talk about something that I didn't think was awesome. <laughs> uh, so Moonraker is the movie that you 
uh, assigned us, Jake. Why? Uh, I I think this, the pickings were pretty slim for 1979. Uh, you know, my, my list right now, like I only, including uh, Real Life, which we just watched, uh, I only have nine movies on my 1979 list. And, you know, I think you had seen uh, the Muppet movie and Apocalypse Now and Alien. Uh, and and I, uh, I really didn't want to give you Neil Young's Rust Never Sleeps because I, yeah. I, I felt like you would not really get much out of that either. So, you know, I gave you a Bond movie. It, you know, at least that checks, uh, checks an item off your list. But it's not a great one the bond film moonraker is about a uh james bond it's a roger james, moore james who? Yeah. it's a roger moore movie and there's a dude named drax who's from a country that doesn't matter apparently <laughs> and uh, he makes rocket ships to go to the moon and, and he's elon musk uh, <laughs> he's from california <laughs> right. <laughs> well, he is in california yeah. which also i'll bring up in a minute doesn't make any sense at all where where this movie is happening at any moment it's in every scene it should be happening somewhere else mm. except maybe mm-hmm. the outer space scenes because it's called moon right here <laughs> although they never go to the moon so uh yeah he he builds a space station so that he can start humanity over um despite the fact that he is a full-grown peter dinklage and um is not the person you would expect to want to uh you know be the genetic <laughs> template one of the Thank notes you. I wrote down for this yeah. movie was villain giving me strong Peter Dinklage energy. Yeah. Sure. I mean, <laughs> I so I Googled that after I clocked it, and I was like, apparently not even close to an original thought. Everyone thinks that yeah. they look exactly the same. <laughs> I recently watched this uh, old Ang Lee movie, Eat, Drink, Man, Woman. Mm-hmm. Um, it's good if you like food. And yeah. in it is the theme from Sex and the City, long bo- or a few years before Sex mm-hmm. and the City came out. And I've never once seen, uh, or I couldn't find anything online where the pe- people who made the theme for Sex and the City gave it credit. So that was nice to find something that... It's like a merengue really or something, about. isn't it? Um, I'm not it's sure. Like a, it's a dance, right? It's the, I mean, there's no lyrics. It's uh, Well, yeah. in Sex and the City, it is. It's a little bit more chill. And eat okay. Drink. Yeah. Anyway, we're talking about Moonraker. So yeah. If you want uh, to. Well, yeah. we must. <laughs> so, we have to. This is the second time you've uh, recommended a Bond movie and the second time it sucked. And I just <laughs> don't get why this is your fallback. When you can't think of another movie to yeah, and well, and the first one was a mistake. The first one that was an accident. I I, yeah. I, I, I could have avoided that one. Yeah. For, for my control, if, if in 1983, uh, I unfortunately had given Brad "Never Say Never Again," <laughs> uh, which is which was pretty pretty bad. I could have given him "Risky Business," but unfortunately, mm. I just I haven't watched it, or I have I have now since, but I at the time I hadn't watched it since Letterboxd had started, so like it didn't you know pop up on my Letterbox as like wow. a movie I'd seen, and it just didn't. It didn't click with me, so I gave him "Never Say Never Again" instead of "Risky Business." Uh, but then so I just, watched "Risky sorry. Business" anyway, and we talked about that. So <laughs> it all worked out. Uh, Mike, what are your thoughts on first on Bond in general and and Moonraker? I I was I think I came late to Bond. I don't think I got into Bond until like high school, probably because of Charlie. Like we've been friends since high school, and like he probably like was like, "Hey, let's watch a Bond movie," and I was like, "Okay." And we probably watched like Goldfinger and some of the other ones. I know. I think we I mean, one time we watched what's the one where they're on jet skis? Spy Who Love Me. Spy Who Love Me. I think at one point we watched Spy Who Love Me, and then when uh, when Gold and I came out, we went and saw that in the theater. That yeah. was the first one I saw in the theater. I liked them. I never loved them. It wasn't until a few years ago I sat down and like watched all the ones I hadn't seen. They are all various levels of entertaining. Even like <laughs> Moonraker, which is like arguably, I mean, not arguably, it's a bad movie, but it's it's a fun bad movie. Like I enjoy watching Moonraker, and so. Yeah, I think I think Bond is fun. It's he's certainly problematic more often than not, but you know that's part of what you get when you get Bond. And as far as Moonraker goes, yeah, like like I said, it's it's not good. Like it's a worse movie than real life, but I had more fun watching it than real life. <laughs> oh, interesting. I would say I felt that way about the first ten minutes of Moonraker. Like the opening scene is genuinely good. The parachuting, skydiving scene is cool. I mean, it, there's too many close-ups of stuntmen's faces. But aside from that, it's a oh, yeah. genuinely exciting. The parachuting scene. Jaws, who looks nothing like Jaws. Yeah, exactly. He has somewhat dark teeth. Come on now. <laughs> they definitely <laughs> painted his teeth. But he's small. And he, I mean, whatever. Skydivers are probably not that big. Um, mm. the, but the guy doing Roger Moore also looks nothing like Roger Moore. So, Charlie, you're a you're a big Bond guy. Yeah, love James Bond. Huge fan. But uh, And I would say, like, uh, I'd say there are two kinds of James Bond fans. There are those who genuinely, truly love it and see it as a pattern as to how one should live their life. Um, that is not me. Um, I, I enjoy James Bond with a heavy dose of irony and like um, enjoyment of looking at it with a critical eye. And, and there's a child in me that just has a whole lot of fun 
with like, you know, sort of the period action of these films, right? But like, you know, rife with misogyny, rife with like world politics I don't believe in, rife with racism and homophobia, like across the board consistently. Going back to the source material, which I have read as well. Oh, wow. um, the, the Ian Fleming books are fun and action packed, but some of the most problematic stuff you'll ever read, like really, <laughs> really hard to handle. Um, so do not recommend. Um, <laughs> but like, you know, it, it you know, I, I started at a young enough age where, you know, you're just like, oh, wait, there's another one of these. Yeah, I'll watch that. And, you know, you're young enough that maybe your critical faculties aren't, you know, entirely uh, up to speed. And you're like, OK, that one had some more of the things. And you start to pick up on the pattern. When you come to something like Moonraker, which I would say is not that bad for a James Bond movie. How about that? Well, okay. So what's worse? I mean, I don't think it's the worst Bond movie because I've seen Never Say Never Again. When you say not so bad for a Bond movie, to me, it suggests that there's many worse Bond movies. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So, so, so Die what Another worse? Day is what it's okay. called. I think that's, that's the worst uh, one, actually. Yeah. That, that's the worst one. Yeah. And, um, and you know, if, if, and there's 25 of these things, yeah. you know, good God. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, and if you kind of go into watching a series like that and admiring it with a healthy source of like perspective, you kind of come to understand that they all can't be winners because like they can't be and they're not. So I, I watched this movie last night for this podcast uh, and I had watched it about a week and a half ago for fun. Right. <laughs> and you felt like, like you needed it again. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, I gotta stay fresh. Come on, I, I'm, I'm a professional <laughs> podcaster here, guys. Um, but uh, you know, it, and it's it's something to leave on in the background, and it's something that you've seen so many times. You're constantly looking for something new, and you're comparing it to other things that, like, have you know, you've seen, like, you know, a, a movie from 1979. Bond movies are so of their time that if you kind of get into like late 70s cinema and watch you're like oh wow you know that scene where the woman is killed with dobermans is this weird like 1970s horror movie yeah a beautiful horror sequence in mm -hmm. the middle of this like you know kind of tack tacky like action-packed misogynist you know space adventure right <laughs> um and and, and i never would have thought that if, if i hadn't been watching kind of you know period films from that time so you come to appreciate that similarly you know, you come to appreciate things like the stunt action of John Glenn. You come to appreciate the score work of John Barry. You know, even in a bad movie like this, there are, you know, really strong, strong parts that are that are ultimately on display. So that's how I watch a Bond movie. And, and some, I would say, are truly excellent films. And you don't have to take this position going in and it's a defense mechanism to like argue that you like things i, I get that you, you don't have to break me down i'm perfectly aware of what's going on here but i still enjoy it tremendously so bond movies i've always liked i like every one of them a bad bond movie is better than most not because it's inherently a better movie I, I am well aware that that is not the case, but, um, you know, just, you know, for a little bit of nostalgia, for a little bit of fun and for the sake of like the obsessiveness, like uh, part of the fun of something like Moonraker is anticipating watching the James Bond beats as they happen. The arrival of Money Penny. What does the double-sided leather quilted door in M's office look like at this time? What's the new dumb gadget? What's the good new gadget? What kind of product <laughs> placement is in the background this time? Are Roger Moore's suits, you know, do they look like they come from the summer 1979 JC Penny catalog? Or was this a good year for suits? Right. <laughs> and and you know, and I think on like a creepier, like, you know, hetero dude level, how hot is this Bond girl? Right. You, you can kind of play that game as well. Though that's not one I tend to tend to sort of dive in as much. But um genuinely a delight. Honestly, Moonraker down low on the James Bond movies I like. I think I enjoyed it the most when I watched it last night. Uh, it's so funny because some of the things that you said that you enjoy about specifically like re-watching an older James Bond movie for, for the tropes, for me, destroyed this movie. For one thing, it's things that don't fit, like the way, spoiler alert for Moonraker, y'all, um, <laughs> Jaws dies at the end in one of the most cynical, depressed, well, okay, he never shows up again in the series. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> He's living his best Golden life with the up. love of his life in space, in perfect harmony. He had that... effectively died at the end of the previous movie, The Spy Who Loved Me. As well, well, he also died yeah. in the beginning of this movie. But, uh, <laughs> I think that's the Tom and Jerry thing for him in this whole movie with him and, and Bond going back and forth with these Very weird... cartoonish. But like yeah. Mike said, he also brings along a relatively innocent Swedish woman who deserved none of it this time. Swedish? Didn't Swiss? he meet her in Brazil? <laughs> no, she's definitely Swiss. I'm pretty sure that... I don't, that, I think that I don't, I don't know. He met, he met her in Rio de Janeiro. 
<laughs> never <laughs> says a word of what I'm talking about. Because in the beginning of the movie, they also say that the plane taking the Moonraker has just entered or just left English airspace, but crashes in the Yukon. So, so that's great. I just found the killing of Jaws's girlfriend very mean, especially since Bun had just said they're going to be fine. They were not fine. Uh, <laughs> Only 100 miles or so to reentry. Brutal. Um, but also things like, I, I also quite like the Doberman scene, but thought it felt very jarring that, mm-hmm. and this happens all the time in, in older Bond movies, especially that Bond had used this woman for the information he needed and then left her to die. It felt jarring in this one to me because things kept happening that weren't remarked upon. Like the assassin in the tree that Bond killed and then looked at Drax and sort of smirked and walked away. Meanwhile, Drax is sitting there holding a loaded gun. Exactly. Two feet away from James Bond. He could have just gone. I, I just don't understand why this kind of thing happens. It reminded me so much of Never because Say Never Again. Because it's cool, Brad. Is That's it cool? <laughs> I guess it's cooling for like cool. dads in 1979. Yeah. Drove me nuts. Why do Bond, I know this is a trope. Why do Bond villains just let Bond hang out? I just don't get why they want him to do so, so they can be arch. Yeah, you know, <laughs> oh, but he's not very arch Drax. He's pretty flat. I, th- those eyebrows are doing a lot of work. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> those black turtlenecks. That that beard. I think it's also very funny, and I like this that his name was Drax, and that another person who played Drax in a different movie became a Bond villain years later. Mm-hmm. In another Bond yeah. movie that I didn't like very much. One mm-hmm. of the things we do on our podcast for any of your listeners who have never listened to us, we at the end of our episode we do what we call a Criterion moment, where we pick a moment from the film that we think kind of exemplifies maybe why that film might have been chosen for the Criterion Collection. And it can be anything from like a great camera movement or a great piece of dialogue, or sometimes it's like the the Criterion moment where it was obvious they were trying to go for a Criterion moment and then just be kind of cringy and cliche. Like we'll even go that direction. And sometimes we just pick something snark because like maybe we didn't like the movie or whatever. (laughs) But like if we were doing this movie on our podcast, the Criterion moment that I would have picked would have been the the pigeon that does the double take in Venice. (laughs) <laughs> more of a triple I, take really you know, a triple take yes because i was just like yeah. you're watching this pretty fun action sequence you know throughout like you know venice and it just cuts of this close-up of a pigeon that's clearly like the kid pigeon turned its head and then they reversed the footage and then yeah. like played it back and forth a few times yeah, it looks like and benny it, hill yeah because it can't <laughs> handle a gondola hovercraft on land <laughs> i was just yeah. like I was like, are you yeah. kidding me? Like a double, a triple take pigeon? Like I just, that made me laugh so hard. I'm like, that's the best moment of this movie. And you've already Nothing's had one guy happen. like look at his cigarette after he sees a coffin in the water. That was my like, favorite. Like, what? <laughs> Another guy's like drinking cigarette. wine. He's like, what am I drinking? And then the pigeons turn to be like, what, what? <laughs> yeah. yeah, no, uh, th- this movie suffers bad when it goes in the direction of humor. Mm-hmm. Um, and I would say it's not good when it goes to like um, plot consistency and logic. What it yeah, does I mean, have I... is a pretty good number of set pieces and then mm-hmm. some real, real bummers like the gondola going through Venice. I mean, on the one hand, it's spectacular. It's yeah. Venice. They took mm-hmm. over the Piazza di San Marco. Like, they, like they did it. Like they organized that huge space in the middle of summer. And it's kind of a spectacle to see. It's dumb. <laughs> I mean, it's pretty dumb. Yeah. You, you can't really defend it, but like that that's kind of what you also need to take to a Bond movie, because this was one of those Bond movies that went big, where there's elaborate parachuting scenes, there's throwback boat chase scenes um, in the Amazon, right? That's it, w- with the music from From Russia With Love playing right. over it, kind of like echoing back into this time period. The, there are scenes during Carnival, they, um, the, the space scenes, I would say... Uh, are bad, are pretty bad. They're yeah. the the way that gravity is implied by everyone just moves in slow motion is pretty <laughs> horrendous and hard to watch. And there's actually an internal logic to the to the gravity in the space station mm-hmm. too, where they're they're doing the rotating space station, which I was shocked. I, I did not give the movie that kind of credit. They, yeah. they um, watched 2001. They know how to rotate a space station. Yeah. I don't know that I buy that they watched 2001. <laughs> I, I do believe they that they the watched... They saw the trailer for 2001. They know how to rotate a space <laughs> station. Know, they definitely watched Close Encounters because the music from Close Encounters is on the keypad. Yeah. And they watched Magnificent Seven because the music from yeah. Magnificent Seven plays when he's riding on a horse. Which, oh, yeah, the, the kind, bad musical, which they usually the don't do. Musical they usually don't do musical callbacks to like other genres. Yeah. Well, it's very strange that they would do the From Russia with Love music and then confuse that with music from other popular movies. Yeah, I mean, but you know, you know, what does James Bond do if not play back that original theme in, in every single movie? You know, 
Um, it's been sort of played in the and in John Barry, who's been who had been scored, he had scored every movie, I think, through Moonraker, with maybe yeah, a couple exceptions right. here and there, right? So, uh, so a lot of this is truly the Broccoli family who owns the rights to making James Bond movies. I think they kind of plan for a few years where they want to go on vacation. Um, <laughs> sure. And then they string together a James Bond movie kind of out of that, or at least a series right. of set pieces. They were the Adam then, Sandler of their time. And then yeah, Broccoli saw sure. Star Wars and said, we need to make a Star Wars. Yeah. They did, that's yeah. Right. That's also something that's fascinating about the Bond movies is that they really are sort of echoes of the time. Like Live and Let Die is, what if James Bond was in a black exploitation movie? Mm -hmm. right and the results are electric right. um and this is star wars is the biggest movie ever made we need to do a star wars and <laughs> and they they kind of put a honestly most of moonraker is a remake of you only live twice and uh the spy you love me except instead of submarines and a space capsule it's a space shuttle right <laughs> yeah. exact same movies right um really no difference except this time they they end up in in space um and I, I, I'll, I'll stop defending this piece of shit movie. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, I guess I'm with Charlie though, and like uh, with the Bond movies, I, I do tend to enjoy even the bad ones, just because for for a lot of those reasons, I like seeing a lot of like I don't need to rehash them all, but like yeah, the you know seeing Money Penny, seeing um the gadgets, uh you know the cars, all that stuff. Like I I, I do enjoy even the bad ones, and this is definitely a bad one. Uh, I, I think Roger Moore has a lot of the the, the worst ones. <laughs> like if I'm, yeah. if I'm looking at my my list, I think you know most of the the Bond bottom five or so are going to be Roger Moore movies along with Die Another Day, which is, is certainly, the, certainly the worst. Yeah, so I didn't like this, but I was really, at, at first I was kind of hyped for it because I hadn't seen it in quite a long time. I think it's been about 10 years. Uh, my friend Jeff Richardson and I watched them together. I had to mention uh, Jeff Richardson on the show. I think that's uh, uh, an obligation. Now. Yeah, obligation <laughs> at this point. Uh, but we did it in like 2012, I think. Probably the last time I'd seen it. So like I'm watching the first half hour or so of Moonraker. I'm like, is this is this better than I remember? Like, is this not bad? Like that first part is really good. Like the skydiving yeah. sequence, like yeah. this is really cool. Like it's all a little bit downhill after that, that, that first half hour. And, and yeah, I think it, it really fell apart for me. Like when we talked about that, that scene already where, where, yeah, he just straight up murders that guy in the tree. And it's just like, <laughs> it's just like nothing, like nothing even happened. It's, I mean, Bond murders a lot of people. That's kind of his thing. But I mean, that, that felt particularly casual uh, in, it's, in a it's way very that... it's very the avengers the like the tv show mm. from back in the day mm. they would do things like that a lot where it'd be sort of catty like oh we shot this guy haha -ha, next mm -hmm. scene right because it was more about getting that joke to get you to commercial and it's also worth recognizing that everyone making this film like down to production design stunt coordinator the guy who animates the opening sequence this is a family business that they had just been they, that they had been in at this point for um, 19, 20 years doing movies about once every other year. Mm -hmm. Right. And this was just the next one. And they, I think got a lot of money to make this one. Like it's, it's a big film. They go to a lot of places. There's a lot of cash up on screen. Right. But then maybe oh, they yeah. weren't caring as much for, you know, like, you know, ma making something that's, you know, good. Right. Like it. writing a cohesive yeah. script or. Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> well, they, well, they, they, they copied some earlier ones that kind of worked. Yeah. I have a question for you, Charlie. Yeah. Does Bond normally have 007 branded spy cameras? No, but he sometimes <laughs> has 007 branded things. That yeah. cracks me up. That's also something with Bond is that they tend to take, they tend to go to the extreme. Like Moonraker is insane. But mm -hmm. what's also nice about it is then they course correct. And then after this one is you only live twice, which has its, it, you know, bizarre stuff in it, to be sure. That's like a smaller kind of spy caper. And then after that, it's Octopussy, which is insane. And they kind of yeah. they kind of ebb and flow with these like tight little movies. And then this just like bombastic excess. And I would even see that the Daniel Craig movies are not immune to this this trend in recent years. I mean, did you say you only live twice came after Moonraker? Oh, I'm sorry for your eyes only. There we go. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I could see on your face. Come like on. Jake's said about this. Come yeah. On, these <laughs> Uh, and then, and then, of course, a view to a kill, which is, you know, in many ways, arguably, you know, among the worst of the James Bond movies. But it's also so funny and so right. fun. Well, Roger right. Moore did it at ninety-five years old, so that's <laughs> exactly, <laughs> exactly, yeah. Well, well, that's when they decided to replace a James Bond that had gotten too old by hiring a guy who was older than him, right? Yeah. But looked <laughs> much, much younger. Yeah. That's <laughs> so when we watched uh, when we watched um, Never Say Never Again. 
I became obsessed with how old each Bond was at, give, at a given time and how old he was compared to the Bond girl. And I was surprised that the Never Say Never Again age gap was not the worst one. I think the Octopussy one is the worst one. No, it's actually um, pretty close with Maud Adams. It's A View to a Kill, I think. Oh, really? Okay. But it's just, uh, but now Daniel Craig, uh, James Bond dies. What's that movie called? No Time to Die. No Time to no Die. No Time to Die. Which is just a lie. Plenty he, of time to die. <laughs> yeah, he's a very, very, very old James Bond, looking very old, but not nearly as old as Roger Moore did in this in a lot of scenes. Sure. And he's quite a bit younger than Daniel Craig was mm -hmm. uh, at the end. So People lived hard back then. Oh, right. That's true. They did. And they had yeah. bad hair and bad style. I think in one other kind of point of defense of the worst parts of James Bond movies, Moonraker in particular, is that um, until the last couple of movies, they were all named after existing Ian Fleming stories. And the movies very often had absolutely nothing to do with the original Ian Fleming plot. They mm -hmm. might take a bit here and there. Um, and the original story, Moonraker, is about... Um, I think a Frenchman in England who's building rockets and they don't fly the rockets anywhere. It's just like the Russians or Spectre or whoever are stealing secrets about the rockets and James Bond has to infiltrate the organization and stop them. But it, it takes place in like the English countryside and he's like going undercover, something that James Bond never does. He always shows up and says, I'm James Bond. And they're like, we know you're the world's most famous spy. And he's like, yep. And I'm spying. And they're like, okay. And, yeah. <laughs> Uh, James Bond really has like never it's my it was my dad's favorite series growing up and yet I never clicked with it still really don't but enjoy like a third of the movies it's not even so much the man whoring that bothers me although that bothers me more in the newer ones than the older ones like in because they know better that they're trying well, to pretty much I mean yeah uh -huh. the the Monica Bellucci stuff I just thought give me a break this is so off and then they never think about her ever again <laughs> and in this one it didn't feel egregious and in the old ones it doesn't feel egregious probably because it's just like you know it's going to happen but what does bother me is just the lack of i don't want a james bond movie to be full of introspection i don't want bond to ponder what it means to be a good man or <laughs> but i'd like him to think twice about the person he talked to in the last scene in the next sure. mm -hmm. uh, but there's bond there's nothing the now the past the future none of that matters that's right 100 percent. bond we doesn't have object permanence <laughs> <laughs> Clearly, I, I'm surprised Bond recognizes anyone's face, period. He's like Brad Pitt. Mm -hmm. Oh, but how mm -hmm. charming is Roger Moore? Like, yeah, he's like he's he? like a charming older uncle, to be sure. But he's <laughs> handsome and he smiles and he tells a joke better than any of the other Bonds did. The jokes are bad, but he tells them better. Um, <laughs> well, it looks, it looks like he believes in what he's saying, but that's, I mean, that's the a pretty actor. low floor. Well, okay, you mentioned that uh, there's a laser disc criterion bit of trivia here there are no current criterion releases that are bond films i assume because now because the broccolis just don't have an interest in doing yeah, that they don't need it yeah i mean back in the day what the criterion collection was was a distribution company that could put together a really nice special features package right right so it, whether it was on laser the box or early dvd yeah so that's right. how some of these blockbusters make their way in all right well let's hear the ratings What's uh, Jake? Let me start with you because you imposed this on me. What is your uh, your rating for Moonraker? I, I gave it two stars on the Letterboxd. So I, if I'm doing math, that's a four. Mm -hmm. Four, yeah, four out of ten. Yep. Mike, what do you got for us? I rated a three. So like on, on our scale of ten for a podcast, I give it a six. It's fun. It's it's, it's bad, but like I had a great time watching it. It's just it's a a silly, fun, breezy watch. It's easy watching. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it gets a, a six from me. Probably. Here we go. So as a as a movie <laughs> taken completely out of context, it's pretty darn shaggy and it really slows down in that third act when it should be picking up big time. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and I, I, I can't deny that. Right. So truly, I don't know, it's probably like from our standard scale, like a five or a six. Mm -hmm. Right. But as a James Bond movie, it's a double oh seven. <laughs> Very nice. well you know it's really a shame though that if we could have done for your eyes only is that the one where roger moore dresses up as a clown because then we could have had two movies. is that octopusy then we could have yeah. two movies where the leading man dressed up as a clown mm. when it was really <laughs> awkward yeah. yeah that's true wow <laughs> yeah i thought of that i was like ah oh, we're so close but not not quite i watched the final 10 minutes of this movie on my phone waiting to get on a bus in hobo as, as the director intended you to yeah, yeah. the way the Chris Chris Nolan would be okay with that yeah i truly did not feel as though i was missing uh, any context or experience that that a dolby surround sound would have helped with um <laughs> so but i i actually truly do 
enjoy the first 30 minutes straight through the um, spinning mechanism scene mm -hmm. where the guy who has a yellow belt and is somehow a, a good fighter because of that tries to kill Bond with G-Force, which I, actually, I thought was very cool. I had to look and, away. I have, I have Meniere's disease. I couldn't watch that. I had to, oh, I, I bet. I had to yeah. look away. Yeah. <laughs> Unless the German nuts. So for that, I, I went 2.5 stars. I give it a five um, for giving me like some stuff to think about in the beginning and then some stuff to forget uh, towards the end. Ob objectively, you're not wrong. Yes. <laughs> I, I, I can't argue with any of that. <laughs> Jake, oh. you have one Oscar bit of Oscar, trivia? yeah, Oscar Love. It was nominated for the Best Visual Effects Oscar, but it did lose to Alien, which that's Quite fair. So. That's, yeah. That's a, yeah, that yeah, sounds that's right. Fair. They got it right that time. Cool. So we also like to talk about our favorite films of the year at the end of every episode. I don't know if y'all come equipped We're with that. that yeah. Oh, very nice. We're in the list game. We, we, yeah, we, we, we I, I, you know, I have letterbox. I always have my my list for each that each year <laughs> set go, and I, I had told Charlie about it, so he made his own list. Amazing. All right, so I'm gonna do. I'm gonna lead the way here. Um, I've got. Hold on, I gotta reorder. My... How, how are we doing this? Are we doing one at a time, or are we all going? We're all gonna do our whole slate. Okay. Trying to figure out how to fit Moonraker into that list. Now that you've seen one, it, really thought about it, no comment. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Let me go top eight here. I, I, yeah, I'm going to go top eight. It, this is MySpace. Yeah, the MySpace. Um, All right. And my top eight starts with uh, Andre Tarkovsky's Stalker, mm -hmm. which I like quite a bit. I liked quite a bit more after I saw Annihilation and then went back and watched Stalker again. That's sure. a cool experience and a great way to, to handle that movie. My number seven is The Muppet Movie. It's, it started it all. Number six is a movie we talked about on the podcast, I think last week, just last week. Uh, because, Jake, you talked about Art Carney beating out one of the most competitive best actor slates when he won for. I can't even remember what movie he won for. Uh, Harry and Tonto is the name of the yeah. movie. There it is. Be he beat uh, the, for the Godfather Jack Nicholson in Chinatown, Pacino in The Godfather Part II, uh, Dustin Hoffman and Lenny. Uh, yeah, I can't remember the uh, the other one. But, yeah, he, he somehow, yeah, Art Carney got the Oscar win that year. Right. So Art Carney started with George Burns and Lee Strasberg and Going in Style, a great heist movie about old dudes robbing a bank that got remade yeah. by, um, who do we decide it was? Michael Caine and, and Morgan Freeman? Morgan Freeman and some other third guy. Didn't like um, Zach Braff direct that too? I have no idea. I don't think so. He, he directed something where I was like, really? Him? It's a different Morgan Freeman movie. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I think you're right. Um, no, I am. Uh, number four <laughs> or number five is Alien. Um, I don't think I have to say much about Alien. It's Alien. Uh, number four is Saint Jack, a Peter Bogdanovich movie about a dude wasting away in East Asia. It's oh wow! Awesome. Yeah, I cannot wait for our Bogdanovich episode. Jake hasn't seen <laughs> any Peter Bogdanovich. Movies. Oh wow! Super blind spot. I'm kind of embarrassed. And then my list gets like a little, a little predictable, boring from here. Number three is Rocky Two, which feels important. Wow! Now. Wow! You don't like Moonraker, huh? All right. Okay. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> my number two movie is real life i i do like it there. and then number one uh sorry to be predictable it's apocalypse now mike what do you got for us my i've i've got on letterbox i have 41 movies logged for 1979 uh, <laughs> number 41, <laughs> number 41. 41. <laughs> i'll give you my top 10 my, my top 10 for for 79 is pretty wild because it's a mix of like kind of some of the obvious choices and a lot of just like weird B stuff that like, I love. And there's a couple movies on here that like people generally hate that I love. Uh -huh. And I think it's some of it's probably like nostalgia from childhood. But anyway, my, number 10, I've got the warriors, which is just, you know, great. At number nine, I've got stalker, which we've mm -hmm. covered on our podcast, you know, which is a great episode. Great movie. Uh, we like did a great thing look. With, if you want more stalker experience, Brad, uh, I, you know, I'm not a big Russian literature guy, but we'll see. You don't have yeah. to read it in Russian. It's cool. Yeah, we read the book and watched the movie. It was it was cool. My number seven, no, number eight, is John Batham's Dracula with uh, Frank Langella and Laurence Olivier. I think it's just a fun take on the Dracula story. I mean, there's so many versions, but that version is really good. Number seven is The Black Hole, which is a movie a lot of people hate, but I love that movie. I even rewatched yeah, talk, it. Talk about like Star Wars ripoff fever. Yeah, yeah. for sure. And, it, and it, I rewatched it like two years ago. Because, like, I was like, that can't stand up. Like, it's got to suck. And I watched it. I was like, that's movie's still great. What's, there, what's people's problems with this movie? It's so good. When I was a kid visiting my grandparents in Florida, that was the movie that was always on. I've probably yeah. seen that movie 10 or 11 times. Yeah. yeah so good. My, I had uh, the read-along, like, 45 record, like, picture book. Yeah, I had, like, I had, like the cassette. Like, the book and cassette. 
My number six is Werner Herzog's Nosferatu. There are two Dracula movies on my list. <laughs> number five is Steve Martin's The Jerk. Like, one of my favorite Steve Martin movies, one of my favorite comedies, like, just classic. My number four is Phantasm, one of my favorite horror movies, which a lot of people hate, but I love that movie. <laughs> my number three is Lucio Fulci's Zombie, also known as Zombie 2, also known as Zombie Flesh Eaters, but it's my all-time favorite zombie film. Amazing movie. A little slow, but it's got just, it's just so good. Uh, my number two is Alien, and my number one to no one shop is Apocalypse. All right, Charlie, lay it on us. Uh, yeah, I'll do 10. Uh, good amount of overlay with what y'all have gone through so far as well. Uh, my number 10, Mike, Warriors as well. Not the director's cut that came out a few years ago. Don't, Don't watch really it. See that. It's not good. Watch the original one. Yeah. The one that the studio butchered. It's better. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Muppets movie. Yeah, absolutely love it. Um, it's low because I think there are better Muppets movies. Some of those star Charles Grodin, star of real life. <laughs> uh, the Jerk. Uh, yeah, it's been a while since I watched it. I don't know. Have pretty fond memories of that movie. I like to think it's. Uh, I like to think it holds up, but I don't know. I'm going to jump in. Mike, when was the last time you watched The Jerk? It's last year. I'm currently <laughs> watching every Steve Martin movie right now. And so that was what I watched last year, and I still love it. We we talked, we, we met, we, you know, Charlie joked, go, go from 41. Uh, jerk is my lowest movie in my 1970s. And, and I understand that. Like, so it I mean, doesn't click with some people. That's fine. I watched it for the first time in 2021, and that's just not how to watch The Jerk. You have to have watched it. I think so. Yeah. I think if you watch it when you're 13, like, it might be the best movie ever made. Yeah. 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 Uh, right, my number continue. seven. Now we're starting to get into uh, some, like, uh, Criterion discoveries that Mike and I have gotten through our podcast. Uh, the Brood. Just oh. solid Cronenberg. Yeah. Right. So Canadian. Right. But also so creepy and weird. Um, I like that one a lot. Uh, Australian film, My Brilliant Career by Gillian Armstrong. Just sort of excellent, like kind of proto-feminist period piece. My number five, a little movie called Moonraker. <laughs> nice. <laughs> number four, Stalker. I like that movie a lot, as we've discussed. Number three, Apocalypse Now. Ooh, it didn't hit number one. Number two, a film that Mike adores, Shohei Imamura's Vengeance is Mine. <laughs> uh, kind of a Japanese kind of nasty little like serial killer crime. It's towards the bottom movie. of my list. You like it or you don't. You know, it's it's very, very divisive. And then number one is Alien, which is quite possibly a perfect movie. Mm -hmm. All right, Jake, let's have it. Well, I technically have a top nine, although after uh, having listened to Mike's list, I can say um, I've definitely seen The Warriors and The Jerk, and my memory of them is that I like both of them a lot, but I haven't seen them in the letterboxed era, so I, I don't have them like like marked on there on my list, but those would be my, my honorable mentions for 1979. Uh, and then my list, if I'm going from nine to one, nine, sorry, Brad, is real life. It's my least favorite. Uh, Make the eight, list. Well, yeah, so this is my question. You're, you're, so you're, but you're including it now because I, I have movies from. <laughs> have you seen nine I've movies from this year? Is that why it's on the list? <laughs> that's all I've got. Yeah, that's all I have. In, all right. in, so there's, a, there's a reason I didn't say The Jerk or Castle of Cagliostro. Not every Miyazaki movie is good. No, I'm just, I'm just going with what I have. I'd like to get. I wish I had ten, but I don't. You know, I don't. Uh, <laughs> eight, uh, eight then would be Moonraker. Um, number seven is the TV version of All Quiet on the Western Front that starred Ernest Borgnine. So you, we're as, still in you don't like it territory. Yeah, it's not it's not great. But now we're getting to number six. Now we're getting to movies that I do like. Uh, number six is Star Trek The Motion Picture. Um, again, haven't seen it in a while, but I do like it. It's good. Number five, I mentioned earlier, is the Neil Young concert film Rust Never Sleeps. Uh, mm -hmm. It was the first Neil Young album I ever heard. Um, fell in love with Neil Young. Still obsessed with him today. Still think it's a really, really good concert movie. It is, uh, yeah. It's excellent. Yeah. The, the, I didn't think yeah, about it. I might have to rethink my list. Yeah. Good pull. Yeah. It's cool. Thank you. Number four is Rocky two. Not as good as Rocky one, but I do really, really enjoy it. It is fun. Uh, yeah. Yeah. It's just a good, good sequel. I mean, it's the right ending and um, yeah, it's just, it's cool. It's a really good follow up yeah. uh, to a, to a really, really good movie. I think Rocky one holds up really, really well uh, today. Still. Are Number we three, dedicating this episode to Carl Weathers? I think we oh, should. Yeah. Sure. Sure. Yeah. Absolutely. And maybe after this, we can get a stew going, you know? Number three, um, we're getting yeah familiar territory now. Number three is the Muppet movie. Uh, number two is Alien, and then number one is uh, Apocalypse Now. Oh, Apocalypse Now! Come on, we are very creative <laughs> people with diverse choices and tastes. I thought this list was pretty crazy, right? Because I I would say that like looking at the I, I looked at like a list of movies that came out in 1979 to kind of refresh this. I don't have a letterbox, but it was like those are like. 
I, there are like 10 really good movies that came out this year, like really good movies. And then a lot of movies that weren't that good. So I'm trying to make these pretty strong top 10 to 20 lists for every year going back as far as I can. Mm-hmm. And I hit a real snap. Like 1983 is impossible. It's got to be the worst year ever in movies. It's really <laughs> the only year where I can't find 10 really good movies. Sure. And maybe 1970. But that could also just be I haven't seen enough. But besides that, the 70s, every year, easy 10, sometimes 20. Yeah, but, um, but I would say truly there's like two all-timers on this list. Oh, that's true. And then yeah. maybe, you know, it's kind of, I, yeah, I like this movie too. I, I'm going to ask everybody to watch or rewatch St. Jack. It's it's really, really quite excellent. And uh, Never heard of it, yeah. So, so good. Thank you guys so much for joining us today. Where can people hear more of you? Uh, we can be found at Random Acts of Sin on social media. Our podcast is, of course, Random Acts of Cinema. Um, and yes, find us out in the world. Yeah. Oh, and we also have um, Discord. We have but, Discord. Uh, but for those who are interested, we're doing another kind of list-centric idea. In this case, we're watching everything ever made by William Friedkin. I have a friend who doesn't think recently, <laughs> actually, yeah. That sounds awesome. We'll be back next week with, I don't know, we'll figure it out. If you want to know what is coming out next week, go to our Letterboxd profile. You can find me at Brad Garoon on Letterboxd. I think, Jake, you're Jake Ziegler on Letterboxd. Yeah, it's uh, yeah, Jake underscore Ziegler. And both of us have pinned to our profiles our Never Did It podcast list. You could also just search for the Never Did It podcast list. And the two movies that will be discussed on next week's episode are always at the top of that list. We have a Facebook page now as well. You can check that out at uh, facebook.com slash Never Did It podcast. I'll be posting on that with uh, new episodes and uh, just fun updates from time to time about what we're watching and what's coming up so check that out and thank you for joining us for never did it